Well, hello there. This is Joe Van Cleve, and welcome to another episode of the Typewriter video series. And today, I'm uh, just recording from my office. My little YouTube studio is off to the camera left here. But uh, I'm typing with this Hermes 3000. This is the boxy 1970s looking version of the machine. And uh, I've shown you this machine before in previous videos. Uh, the reason why I'm typing with it though is because this machine I bought back in the mid aughts, maybe 2007 or 8 or 9, I don't know, somewhere in that time frame, I can't remember. I bought it for my grandson Noah when he was a young man, about 9 or 10 years old. And uh, this week, as you might know, he was involved in a terrifically bad car crash and he's currently in the hospital still. He'll be there for weeks undergoing skin grafts and other uh, major surgeries for the burns he received and uh, I, I've i already shared this with you guys on Facebook and on my blog and I've uh, received a lot of uh, positive response and encouragement and I really appreciate the extended uh, internet typewriter community the, for all your thoughts and prayers. But I wanted to talk a little bit today in uh, relating to typewriters. I wanted to talk about uh, how typewriters can function as mementos of people who have once owned or used them. Um, this machine was used by my grandson Noah, as I said, and he wasn't a prolific writer of uh, being a young man more athletically inclined, but uh, he did write a number of pieces on this typewriter that he subsequently posted, or I posted for him, to this blog I created for him called The Line Writer. And so this was The Line Writer's typewriter. So as I uh, thumb through this stack of paper here that I have in a folder, this is uh, most, I think, all the stuff that he wrote over the years. Not a whole huge lot. Um, he used several different typewriters, like for instance, this little uh, piece is a multi, what is it, five or six pages on Little America Hotel stationery was done with my Royal Mercury because we were on vacation at the time and that was the typewriter I brought with me. But a lot, of, most of this stuff was typed on this Hermes 3000, which I can tell by the style of font. So it was neat to see going through this uh, how much of this was typed with this machine, which indicates to me that he was uh, definitely enjoying the idea of owning his own typewriter and using it as a tool. Uh, so it's interesting uh, when we think about writers, and of course my grandson Noah, you know, it's not a writer writer, but a young kid dabbling in writing for the first time. It's interesting when we think about writers, um, there was a recent thread on the Facebook Antique Typewriters group about uh, Jack Kerouac's uh, scroll and the question pertained to what kind of a typewriter did Jack Kerouac use uh, to type the scroll and I think somebody decided it was probably some kind of an Underwood if my memory serves me correct. If I'm wrong leave a comment in the notes below. Um, it, not that it's that important. I mean if you think about the analogy would be photography and people that want to do street photography often feel it necessary to buy a Leica rangefinder camera because that's the kind of camera that Henri Cartier-Bresson used in his photography implying that somehow if we use the same tools we might get similar results. Um, I'm not so certain that that is true. Uh, I know the tools are important to the artist. I'm not so certain how uh, readily you can find results similar to that of an artist by using the same tool, but it's an interesting thought. But I do know that um, these Hermes, three, Hermes 3000s and the 2000s that preceded them were very much considered high quality typewriters and of course anybody who knows typewriters knows they are indeed. They have a wonderful touch and feel to them. And, pretty darn quiet I would say. Uh, one of the quietest typewriters, manual typewriters I've used I think. But getting back to uh, the idea of typewriters and writers and how they're related, 
Um, I think that it's interesting when I put this roll of teletype paper into, into a machine like this. It does tend to change the way I write, knowing that I don't have to stop for the end of the page and threading up a new sheet and getting it lined up and started and everything. I can just keep typing. That's a really interesting effect. Um, so in the sense, you know, emulating, copying one of the techniques that Jack Kerouac used. Of course, keeping in mind that I'm not using coffee, benzedrine, and whatever drugs he's, he might have been using. I, I have some tea here. Uh, so I don't intend on being a beat writer is what I'm saying. But uh, it's interesting how a lot of times the kinds of machines that famous writers used over the years are very sought after. Um, Larry McMurtry, what did he use? An Olivetti Letter of 32, I think, something like that. Some of those machines have gone on auction for sale for a lot of money because of the reputation of famous people who, who use them as tools for writing. But for my personal use uh, of this typewriter, I took this machine out of uh, a storage uh, where I had it uh, just today and I think I'm going to keep this here on my little tray table in the office and I'm going to be using this machine for a while um, in this, the, with the idea that its owner, uh, Noah, you know, has uh, of course has not been using this, this for a while and is also uh, in, in a situation uh, that is very in, uh, a uh, very bad situation uh, physically. And so as we think about him, I hope that I can think about him and uh, as I use this machine, um, knowing that he used it, and hopefully maybe in the future we'll continue to use it, but uh, I'm just uh, thinking that if you've ever had a relative, maybe a grandfather, father, mother, somebody who wrote with a typewriter and maybe you inherited their typewriter, uh, maybe you have a special connection to them because of that typewriter, knowing that they used it. Let me give you a personal story. Um, my mother died when I was five years old, but I do have a one of the few memories of her when I was very young, I might have been three or four, sitting in the kitchen, sitting in her lap in front of a typewriter, and she was typing and I was watching her hands, and she paused, did a carriage return, and then I proceeded to type the entire sentence that she typed. And it, it was too young, I was too young to know how to recognize letters or to read. But somehow I was able to type it either, maybe I just happened to memorize the position of her fingers, I don't know. But I remember her praising me for uh, <laughs> having typed what she typed. But what's funny about that memory is I don't remember what the typewriter looked like, and later on, after she passed away, I don't remember there ever being a typewriter in the in the family. Um, until later on in the early 70s, my dad bought us a Hermes 10 electric. But whatever manual typewriter she was using at the time, I don't remember what it was. My brothers don't remember what it was. But I do have that memory of, it, of her and a typewriter in me, and so that's very special. So I think there is this kind of connection between uh, a personal connection between typewriters and uh, and r loved ones and relatives who might have used them. A few months ago I was at a coffee shop down by the University of New Mexico and it was a coffee shop I normally don't go to very often but they had a pile of books and magazines and I happened to pick up an old dog-eared copy uh, there of the portable beat reader uh, edited by Ann Charters and uh, I happened to read something in there uh, about Jack Kerouac and some of the advice he gave on how to write, how his writing style progressed. And I, I actually wrote, uh, by, I had a pen on me, and I wrote, uh, wrote a, that list down on a spare piece of paper I had with me and uh, took it home, typed it up, and stuck it up on the wall back here. And uh, I've had that for a few months now, and then I decided heck, I'm just going to go to Amazon and order the book, you know. So I have this book of the portable beat reader that I've been reading through. And I was uh, reading Allen Ginsberg, reading through Howl, which is his uh, 
epic, famous uh, beat poem. And uh, I'll read you a little uh, excerpt from Part 3, Section 3 of Howl. I'm with you in Rockland, where you laugh at this invisible humor. I'm with you in Rockland, where we are great writers on the same dreadful typewriter. <laughs> I thought that was pretty cool. On the same dreadful typewriter. Okay, so think about the late 1940s into the 50s, and these beat writers are... Uh, this is a small group of writers that are congregating in the New York area and later on in the San Francisco Bay Area. And uh, apparently, unlike today, but apparently typewriters were really important to being a writer back then because, first of all, you couldn't submit a handwritten manuscript to a, to a, a publisher. Um, you had to have it mechanically printed. And of course, we didn't have computers and printers on our desks, like here's my printer right here. We didn't have that. So you had to have a mechanical writing device in order to write a manuscript. So typewriters were essential to being a professional writer, or to, to, even to the idea of being published. And so I find it funny that, <laughs> that he mentions about uh, the same dreadful typewriter. That tells me that the quality of the typewriter was very important to these writers. Uh, at least as important to them as amateur collectors and users of typewriters now in the post-typewriter era. How we like certain typewriters based on the way they feel and touch. Well, can you imagine how important that was to a professional writer or poet in that era? Uh, not only the quality of the imprint, which had a lot to do with how well your manuscript appeared when you submitted it to a publisher for consideration, but just the usability of the typewriter. Uh, how much hassle was it? How much work was it to use? Uh, so, I'm, I'm just guessing, right, that Kerouac and Ginsburg and that whole crew they probably went through a whole bunch of dreadful typewriters in their day, considering the fact that in their economic standing at the time when they first got started, they probably weren't in any kind of a position to be buying brand new, spanking new typewriters that worked like perfectly and could afford them to get serviced. I'm just guessing that they went through a lot of beat up secondhand typewriters, beat typers, right? Appropriate enough for them. So, the same dreadful typewriter. I thought that was very cool. And so, uh, I don't know if this is a part of the history of writing in the 20th century. How writers and their machines are so intimately connected with each other, and yet that interrelationship, I don't believe, has been documented um, or written about that much. So, these are my rambling kind of uh, disjointed thoughts as I'm sitting in front of the line writer, Noah, his typewriter, this beautiful blue and beige machine. I can actually say it is rather beautiful in spite of its boxy, plasticky, 1970s, 70s kind of styling. But uh, it is a, certainly a pleasure and a joy to use, this machine is. I can say that. So I'm going to be leaving this machine on the tray table here in my office. I can pick the whole thing up, carry it around the house with me wherever I want with a scroll of paper on it. And I'm not really sure at this date what I'm going to be using it for. I could be writing blog articles, but I also have a sense that maybe I'll be writing some more personal stuff relating to uh, maybe my thoughts about uh, my, my grandson and maybe, who knows, advice to him, written stuff that I can give to him later. I'm not really sure what I'm going to do, but, you know, as I've said before and I've uh, talked about before on this series, um, typewriters are inspirational. And if you've ever seen a child set down in front of a manual typewriter, you can immediately see that inspiration begin to work when they just gravitate to it and they start hammering out words and letters even if they don't know how to spell all that well which is very funny because I have another folder full of 
typings from my younger grandkids who can barely spell and read and it's very funny to see what they write but typewriters mechanical typewriters are sort of intrinsically uh, creative inducing machines so I'm hoping that I will be induced to put some creativity at work here on Noah's typewriter so this is my disjointed kind of rambling thoughts on this rather um, interesting and sad week in our family but I'm hoping that you guys have a better week and we look forward to seeing my grandson heal up in the next few weeks and months. It'll be a long journey ahead of him in recovery. But um, I want to encourage you guys to keep writing and especially think about the importance of typewriters in your family and friends circle, how they might be connected to one another, and how typewriters, uh, certain types of typewriters have become very important to certain writers over the years. And I hope they become important to you too. Well, until next time, maybe I'll have something a little bit more uh, formal and put together. But until next time, this is Joe Van Cleve, and you have yourselves a great day.